people and welcome our YouTube friends, all five of you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, well, welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. We're, we're going into the book of Matthew chapter 24, and, and, and the title of my message is an exhortation. It's watchful living. Watchful living. I'm here to, to exhort you to, to live watchfully. Excuse me, that we, we, should be, we should be the type of people that live with a weathered eye on the horizon because great things are coming down the path for those of us who believe. And so we, we, need, to, we need to constantly be in, in remembrance of this. So let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, beginning with verse 32. We're going to read several verses, so let's, let's do this. Matthew 24, 32 says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know, what's, you know summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation <clears throat> will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. <clears throat> then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Father God, we lift up this, this passage to you. We ask that you would quicken our hearts to be able to receive from it. We, Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. We pray that you would give us spiritual vision so that we can see what the Lord has trying to show us. And Father, I pray that you would put upon us a desire to live in a watchful expectation of great things yet to come. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I love about God is He's never caught by surprise. Okay? We, human beings, we get caught by surprise, but God knows exactly what's going on. We know that before the foundation of the world, God chose us to be saved, to be blessed, to be part of the church. God knew that Israel would not get it. God knew that Israel would miss the prophecy that he gave to them. But he still gives it anyways. In Daniel chapter 9, he gave a very specific prophecy. He told the nation of Israel the very day that the Son of God would come to the nation of Israel and present himself as Messiah, and the leadership of Israel blew it. Okay? Now, some people think, oh, oh, you know, God must have been like, oh, i got to scramble and figure out a new plan. No, no, no. No, no. God knew that Israel was going to blow it, even though he did everything he could, even appealing to their own traditions to show them he was Messiah. He knew that they wouldn't get it. So he, he long before Israel re rejected, the leadership of Israel rejected the Messiah, he had a plan, and that plan was you. That plan was the church. That plan was a body of believers consisting of born-again Jews and born-again Gentiles coming together into one body, the virgin bride of Jesus Christ, the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, kings and priests unto their God. Okay, And, he, and Jesus knew that as he was talking with his disciples. Now, the, the context of this passage is his disciples early in the chapter came up to him and said, Hey, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? Now, some pastors walk around acting like you should never ask that question. Don't talk about Jesus coming back. It's, it's just too scary. It's too controversial. We, you know, we don't need that mess here. You know, but, but Jesus did not discourage his disciples from asking when he was going to return. It's only fair because he, for three years he kept telling them, I got to leave you. You know, I, I got to preach the gospel. 
I got to raise the, the dead, heal the sick, give sight to the blind, cause the lame to walk, you know, cause the mute to speak, and then I must die. I must die at the hands of the Gentiles and then rise again because that's what I was, and then I, I was gonna, I'm going to go to my father's house. In fact, it was such an important uh, issue and it was something that Israel just wasn't getting that he spent 50 days on planet earth after his crucifixion giving the church, it says, uncontroversial proof about what was to happen. And in fact, as he was ascending into his, to his father's throne and the disciples are gawking at him, waiting for him to come back, the angel says, what are you doing? This Jesus whom you saw leave in the clouds is going to come back in the same manner. Amen. You, you know, and Jesus told them, you wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. You see, the church is the vehicle of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. That's why there is no need for a temple in Jerusalem right now. Because you, we, me, we are the temple of God. And we can go worship God anywhere, any place, at any time, in spirit and in truth. God knew this, and he, had, he was orchestrating all these things. He knew what was going on, and so he was trying to tell his disciples, watch and pray. And that's my thesis. We believers in Jesus Christ need to watch and pray for Christ's return. Now, some of you have studied this in depth, and maybe you might be a little bit bored about this issue. But I'm here to tell you, it's not a matter of studying it, it's a matter of living it. Okay, it's a matter of day by day, moment by moment, expecting Jesus to come. In fact, the Holy Spirit wants to come to us and give us signs, miracles, and wonders. I believe that with the preaching of the Word of God, there are healings that can happen, that the, that the dead can be raised, that the sight can be, the, the blind can be given their sight, that the deaf can hear, that the lame can walk. And there are ministries out there where people are getting healed of all these things. Of course, what is our attitude in America? Ah, it's just a show. It's, it's all a fix. They, they hire people to come in and pretend to be blind. They hire people to pretend all this. Maybe there is some of that, but I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of it is real. I have seen it with my own eyes. I have experienced it in my own life. Okay? The power of the Holy Spirit is not some mystical mumbo jumbo being made up by, by con men who are trying to make a buck. The power of the Holy Spirit is real. Okay? We have the, the authority in Jesus Christ to lay our hands on the sick and the sick will be healed. We have the authority to cast out demons and cast down strongholds and principalities and powers. We have the authority to bring every thought and intention under the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ. That's where the battle is for us who are born again. If we're born again, our spirit is sealed until the day of redemption, but our soul is where the battle is in our mind, our will, our intellect, our emotions. That's where we trip up. Some of us are very, soul, very soulish Christians. We don't buy this stuff. We, we think it's just a, just a bunch of trickery. But I'm here to tell you, we need to be spiritual Christians. Okay? We can't afford to be like Corinth. The Corinthian Christians, Paul says, I wish I could speak to you as spiritual, but I can't. You're carnal. And you know what the sign of carnality is? Division. Division. Do we have division amongst us? If we do, then we're carnal. And we need to repent of it, cast it out, and love one another. That's, you know, the 11th commandment. Right? Right, bud? Yes. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So Bud likes to call it the 11th commandment. Not that there is actually 11 commandments. We're not teaching that, okay? It's not a new doctrine. We're just kidding around, okay? All right. So we believers need to watch and pray. And my points are this. We're going to look at point number one, the days of Noah. Point number two, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number three, the unknown hour. Okay? And if you're taking notes, you don't have to take notes, but if you are taking notes, what I'm going to do is I want us to go to another verse, a Pauline verse, that kind of sums up this living watchfully. Okay? And so keep your finger here in Matthew 24, and let's turn to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 13, focusing in on verse 13. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's Jesus, right? Teaching that 
denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul is telling us that we're to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Some people want to tell you that that's, this exact, that's, just, that's just two ways of saying the same thing. No, it isn't. The blessed hope is the rapture. The glorious appearing is what we would technically call the second coming. Because if you read, if you know anything about the rapture, um, and, in fact, what I want to do before each and every one of the three points, so if you're taking notes, make another page and make two columns because we're going to compare the difference between the rapture and the second coming. I think this needs to be clarified because I think there's a lot of confusion. And there are churches out there that teach that the rapture and the second coming are one and the same thing. And I don't think the Bible teaches that. I think you have a lot of problems trying to, to harmonize that type of viewpoint. So the, before I get into the days of Noah, I want to give you five comp uh, contrasts, compare and contrast of the rapture. So if you're taking notes, put rapture in one column, uh, second coming at another column. And the first five compare and contrast is this. At the rapture, Christ comes in the air for his church, for his own. The second coming, Christ comes with his church to the earth. Do you see the difference? In one, he comes in the air. The other one, he literally comes down to the earth. Point number one. Point number two. In the rapture is of all Christians. Christian, all Christians are... every. If you're born again... When the rapture occurs, you're going. Don't let anyone tell you that, oh, if you're, if you're having a bad carnal day, you're going to get left behind. No, 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 no. The Corinthian church was one of the most carnal churches you'll ever want to know. And nowhere in the two letters to Corinth did, did Paul ever write that some of you are going to miss the rapture because you're carnal. It's not there. Okay? So the rapture of the church is for all Christians. And, I, and God gave me a vision of that. It's awesome. Believe me, it's going to be so cool. The second coming, no one is raptured. No one is taken up into heaven at the second coming because Jesus is coming back to the earth. At the rapture, he comes in the clouds and we meet him in the air and he takes us to, the, to heaven. Okay. Number three, Christians taken at the rapture are taken to the Father's house. Uh, Audio Adrenaline had a really cool song about that. You'll have to check it out. Audio Adrenaline, My Father's House. Check out that song. It's a hoot. Okay? But, but the church, we are going to be taken into the Father's house. Jesus said in John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. So that's where we're going. Okay? At the second coming, resurrected saints don't see the Father. There's no looking at the Father because no one's taken up into heaven. That's point number um, uh, three. Point number four. No judgment is given at the rapture. There's no judgment at the rapture. That comes later on when we're all in heaven, we'll be standing at the Bema seat of Christ. Okay? However, Christ judges the inhabitants of the earth at the second coming. And I refer you to Matthew chapter 25, the end of that chapter, where he judges the sheep and the goats. Okay? Um, fifthly, the church is taken to heaven at the rapture, that's, but at the second coming, Christ sets up his kingdom on the earth. So, one, so you see, one is heavenly, one is earthly. Okay? All right, first point, the days of Noah. Let's get, get back to our text. Yes, you didn't think we were going to get back to it, but we are. We're going to get back to our text. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. Okay? Now, the, the, now verses 32 through 35 were my intro. Okay? And in verses 32 through 35, it tells us, Jesus tells his, his church, we are in the season of his return. Wait a minute, think about that. How could they be in the season of his return two, almost 2,000 years ago. I'll tell you how. There's a simple doctrine called the doctrine of imminency. It means that, that Jesus' return to rapture his church is imminent. It could happen at any moment. Okay, Jesus could have raptured the church. If the church was full, if the fullness of the Gentiles had come in by the first century, he could have raptured the church then. And that, that would it. That would be the church, the body of Christ. But the fact of the matter is he's been collecting souls for 20 centuries. 
because he's merciful, not wanting any to perish. I don't know about you, but I thank God that the rapture did not occur even 50 years ago. Or, well, actually, that wouldn't affect, uh, maybe 70 years ago, okay? Because if it occurred 70 years ago, I don't exist probably, okay? And I bet most of you don't either, okay? But the fact of the matter is God was merciful to me and has spent 20 centuries, almost 2,000 years, collecting souls. Why? We learned in our Bible study in Revelation, it's because God wants a big, fat pearl to hang around his neck. Okay. All right. So, 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 you know, we, they were, that's the first point. The second point is that we as believers should understand the times and seasons. In fact, we're supposed to. That's another part of watchful living. We need to understand the times and seasons. And for, for another reference, keep your finger here, Matthew 24. Let's just go real quick to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the first three verses. Uh, Paul makes this very clear. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1. One through three, um, Paul makes a very interesting uh, series of statements. Okay, in First Thessalonians chapter five, the first three verses, it says, "But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night." For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And I want to read verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. The world doesn't realize what's coming. They have no clue. In fact, I believe that when the rapture occurs, they're all going to be partying that we're out of here. Those troublemaking, irritating, narrow-minded, homophobic haters are gone. We got them out of here. And, they're gonna be, and, and there's going to arise a world leader that he's going to start off as a, as a king of peace. In fact, the Bible tells us that he will destroy many through a false peace. Okay? And these people are going to say, the people that are, are deceived by the Antichrist are going to be saying, Peace and safety, finally we got rid of the warmongers. Think about it. What religion do they blame wars on the most? Not the Muslims, not the Buddhists, not, not Hindus, Christians. I've even heard from our own people say that Christians are far more dangerous than the Muslims. And I smile, because we are. <laughs> but not the way they think we are, okay? Not the way they think we are. We don't, we're not fighting a physical war. We're not called to strap bombs to our bodies and blow the infidels up. We're called to go to where the infidels are and preach the gospel to them so that they can become one of us. Okay? So, so um, we believers should understand the times and seasons, but we should understand that non-believers won't. And then the final statement is in verse 35. Where it says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. God's word is true. When God says something, that's it. It's done. In fact, He spoke the very universe into existence by His word. He spoke it. It was done. Right now, Jesus is on the throne of His Father saying, Father, can I get Him? Can I go get my people? And the Father saying, not yet. The pearl is still growing. That's the code word. That's our code word. The pearl is still growing. Use that. Take that. Say that to your unsafe friends. Say, yeah, I heard from my pastor that the pearl is still growing. And then walk away. Don't say anything after that. Let them come to you and say, what on God's green earth are you talking about? And then you can witness to them because they asked. Okay? But shh, don't, you know, don't let them know what you're doing. Okay? The pearl is is still growing. That's the, that's the code word, okay? Pearl's still growing. <laughs> it's such a troublemaker. <laughs> All right, the days of Noah, point number one. Verse 36 of Matthew 24, it says this, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, if you're inquisitive like me, 
you go, days of Noah, huh? What was it like during the days of Noah? Now, I, I'm, I'm warning you, okay, don't ask that question unless you're willing to go into some really creepy, controversial uh, passages of Scripture because we're told what the days of Noah were like in Genesis chapter 6. And there was some weird stuff going on on planet Earth at that time. And, 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 and it's, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to exercise the fruit of self-control. I'm not going to go there, okay? I'm merely mentioning it because, you know what? I shouldn't have to spoon feed everything to you guys. You need to use your, you need to do your own investigation because you know what? It'll mean more to you if you do your own investigation. Okay, but we do know, we do know that in the days of Noah, people were partying. They were marrying and giving in marriage and stuff. And here you have this dude, right, who was talking to God, okay, or God was talking to him as well, and he builds this huge barge. It's a barge. I mean, it's, it's bigger than a lot of the oil tankers. If you really look at the measurements of the ark, it was huge. It took them 120 years to build it. Okay, And during those 120 years, we're told that he was a preacher. That he was preaching to the world, look, rain's coming. The world's going to get flooded. And I want you to know something. The environment of the earth was so much different back then. Back then, there was no such thing as rain. There was a water canopy that covered the earth. Okay, And the environmental conditions were universal across the board. But when the flood hit, the flood altered the, the atmosphere of this world drastically, so much so that we've actually found woolly mammoths at the poles with flowers in their mouths and in their digestive tracts. And the flowers that are in their mouths can only exist in very narrow temperatures between something like 70 and 75 degrees, something like that. Very narrow. In other words, they're tropical flowers. They, they could not exist in a cold... When the flood hit, the poles were created. But before that, the whole earth had a universal temperature. And, and they also believe there was one big giant supercontinent. And if you look at the continents and you, like, you drift them all back together, they seem to kind of fit into one big supercontinent. Okay? And, and you know what? It was, it, the, at some point, the, 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 that big supercontinent started to split and drift. And it was in those days that things were coming down from, from heaven. Okay? And again, you have to do your own, your own research. I'm not going to get into that. Okay? But, but in the days of Noah, the non-believing people, the ones that were probably laughing at Noah, calling him a nut job, they didn't see it coming. And in fact, the scripture tells us that once all the animals were brought into the ark, God told Noah and his family again, and it was God who shut the door of the ark and sealed it and 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 it was th that when he did that that was seven days before Methuselah died seven days after God shut the door of the ark Methuselah died and the prophecy that was found in the name of Methuselah came to tr came to truth came to, to be and again I've just given you something else you need to kind of dig into and find out what was that prophecy because I'm not going to tell you not here not now okay uh, you might get into it in the Bible study that's going on right now okay but anyways <laughs> all right um, but we know that in the days of Noah people were giving in marriage and and taking in marriage and they were partying they had no idea but Noah did and he was watchful and he was praying we know what's coming we need to be watchful and we need to be praying for the return of Jesus Christ. Okay? We need to be doing that. It's not just a doctrine that we argue over or a doctrine that we believe in or, or, or you know, uh, but it's an actual fact of a command given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 38, it says, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving marriage until, the day of, until Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. The second coming, believe it or not, even though there are lots of prophecies that will precede the second coming, when Jesus comes back to the earth, people are going to be surprised. But more, but more people are going to be surprised when he raptures his church. 
You know, think about that. that that's a weird doctrine. Okay? Because, I, and I believe it completely, that there's going to be a day when millions, possibly billions, of born-again Christians are just going to be gone. They're going to be there, walking with God, and then they're going to be not, because God took them. We have the model in Genesis 5. Enoch walked with God, and then Enoch was not, because God took him. But you notice, in the early part of Enoch's life, he didn't walk with God. The birth of his son caused him to get close to God. I'm not saying that he didn't have a relationship with God at that time, but, but the birth of his son, okay, and by the way, his son was Methuselah. Okay? The birth of Methuselah inspired Enoch to walk close to God. And it says Enoch walked with God 300 years, and then Enoch was not because God took him. Amen. The church, as the church, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be walking close with God until He takes us. And I believe that comes through watchful living. Watchful living. So let's talk about the second point. The, you know, well, actually, Jesus, before we do that, before we move to the second point, Jesus says, No one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And in Mark, he, he says, I don't know. When Jesus was on the earth, he didn't know. So does he know now? I believe so. Because if you go to the book of Revelation, Revelation 1 1, it says, God gave Jesus a revelation. What revelation could God the Father give to Jesus? The only thing I know of that Jesus did not have in his repertoire when he was on the earth was knowing the day and the hour of his return. So I believe that Revelation 1 1 answers the question of how and when did Jesus know the day of his return? God gave Jesus, God the Father gave Jesus that revelation. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And notice that it's a revelation of his return. And, and I want to say this. The first book written in the New Testament was 1 Thessalonians. The second book was 2 Thessalonians. Every single chapter in 1 and 2 Thessalonians deals with Jesus Christ coming back to the earth. Every single one. And the second coming of Jesus Christ is the second most mentioned doctrine in the Bible except for salvation. So why aren't we hearing more about it in our churches? You're saying, well, pastor, you talk about it all the time. Amen. Well, that's because I look at myself sometimes as a, as a spiritual Rush Limbaugh, and I want to say, I am the balance. <laughs> you know? See, I, I'll be honest with you. In all the years, all the sermons I listened to as a parishioner, I could probably count on one hand minus a few fingers sermons about Jesus Christ coming back. I just don't remember it being... An, I remember people talking about it, but I don't remember preachers preaching on it that much except for the whack job preachers who weren't so concerned about Jesus as they were the Antichrist. All they talked about was the Antichrist, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. You know, who cares? He's a loser. I don't want to hear about him. I only go with winners. Jesus Christ is the winner. He's the undefeated champion of the universe. Okay? <laughs> you know... All right, the coming of the Lord Jesus. At the rapture, some will be taken, others will be left. Look at, look at verse 40. It says, Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore and pray, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. I believe that there are people out there that should be watching and praying that are not because their very salvation depends upon it. I believe that there are religious people, Christian religious people, except I put Christian in quotes, not really Christian, but just religiously Christian, who don't realize that they need to be born again. Walking into a church does not make you, walking into a church once a week does not make you a Christian. No more than walking into a McDonald's once a week makes you a hamburger. You have, you have to ask Jesus to come into your heart to be born again. Amen. 
Okay, you, have, you need, you need to, to come before God and admit that you are a sinner and that you need salvation and you need to ask Jesus to come into your heart and make him the Lord and Savior of your life. And if you do that, then you are a true Christian. We know that from the scriptures because John 1, verse, uh, John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13 says this. It says, He, Jesus, um, Jesus is in parentheses because that's not in there, but the He is Jesus, came to His own. The own is the Jews. That, again, that's in parentheses, not there. He came to His own and His own received Him not. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. Now notice, even to those who believe upon his name. You have to believe. You have to have full faith. Okay? Who are not born by the will of man, nor by the will of God. I mean, by the will of flesh, but born by the will of God. In other words, you need to be born of God's spirit. And you say, how do you know? You just know. You know that you know that you know. Like Paul, who said, I know whom I believed in, and I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him until that day. You just know. When I was a young Christian, people used to say, how do you know you're born again? I said, I just know that I know. Jesus is in my heart. He talks to me. I hear his voice. I'm one of his sheep. I don't want to follow Confucius. I don't want to follow, you know, people say, oh, you should study the other religions of the world. I don't want to study the other religions of the world. I don't want to listen to the lies. I want, to, I want the truth. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no one else that can bring us to God. And I, now, don't get me wrong. I know that God can use those other, because uh, uh, Chuck um, um, Norris, one of my favorite action figure dudes, started, he was a Buddhist at one time. Today, he's a born-again Christian. He's a born-again Christian. Okay? And in Walker, Texas Ranger, he would, oftentimes, there would be Christian messages in that series. So, not that I'm endorsing that, but, you know, but anyways, Jesus wants us to watch for his return. It's not a, it's not a question, it's a command. Okay? Jesus wants us to be ready for his return. Okay, and so I want to read the next five compare and contrasts. Okay, the rapture is imminent, could happen at any moment. The second coming can't happen for at least seven years. How do I know that? The, 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 tri the, the second coming comes after the tribulation, and the tribulation can't start until Israel and the Antichrist sign a treaty. Okay, a seven year treaty. So there's going to be a seven-year treaty, where seven-year period where God allows the Antichrist to rule the planet. You know what we call that? The tribulation. Okay, all right. Number seven. No signs for the rapture. There needs not be any sign. The rapture could happen right now. Wouldn't it be cool if it happened right now? Wouldn't it be, I mean, you, you could go, whoo, I wasn't sinning. I was in church. Amen. Maybe there'll be some, oh man, I was sinning. I was even in church. What's wrong with me? Just repent right now. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Watchful living. You, you know, get it right. Get right with God. You know? Anyway. What's next? Number eight. <laughs> the rapture is only for the believer. It's only going to affect the believers. We're the only ones that are, we're, we're the only ones that are going to be affected. Uh, you know, as far as being whoop, taken. Okay? But the second coming affects the entire world. The whole world's going to know. See, the rapture is going to bring confusion. They're going to go, what? What happened to all those people? Oh, maybe the aliens took them. It's probably a good thing because those people were backwards. And they were stunting the growth of the human race. Okay? Maybe some who have been witnessed to by us about the return of Jesus might go, Oh, I missed. I know who came in. I know how these, where these people went. And then they become believers. Just saying. Okay. All right. Number nine. The rapture will be a time of joy. Think about it, guys. We are going to see Jesus face to face. No longer this seeing him dimly, like James says. We're going to see him face to face. It's going to be like when, you know, when, you're, when your sons and daughters come back from college on Thanksgiving vacation and on Christmas vacation and stuff. It's like, oh, I remember that. It's like, oh, so joyful. I have no schoolwork. I got no teachers standing over me. I'm just going to eat turkey and watch football and be with my family. And then Christmas time, we're going to open up presents. And there's no classes. There's no Greek. There's no theology. It's just Merry Christmas. Well, the difference between 
our temporal <coughs> celebrations and our eternal celebration is that Christmas will never end Amen. when we're raptured. It's going to be Christmas forever. It's not going to be awesome. That is so awesome. I can't wait. Okay. And then number 10, and, but the time of Jesus' second coming is going to be a time of mourning. And that I refer to you, Matthew 24. We don't have time to go there. But it says the whole world mourns as they see Jesus ascend, descend from the heavens. Okay. They're not going to be happy to see him come. Because you know why? Because they've been fighting against him for seven years, the vast majority of them. Okay. And that, so that, that's that. All right. At the rapture, the saved will be taken. The lost will be left behind. Third point, it's an unknown hour. Okay, we know Jesus is coming back. We know it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. But the third point is we don't know the hour. We don't know the day. Jesus is coming back in an hour and a day that we don't expect. But the faithful servant, the watchful servant, is ready. So my question, are you ready for this? Or are you too busy building your kingdom on this planet? You know, we're called to build the... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added. Do you know, we have a mansion waiting for us in glory. Amen. That's what Jesus said. I can't wait. To check. I live in a dinky little house. Man, I can't wait. You know? I praise God for my dinky little house, but... The faithful servant is going to rule with Christ. How do I know that? Go with me to verse 45. It said, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. You know what? There's a church on planet Earth that wants to rule the Earth right now, and they're ahead. Of, they're ahead of God's. They're, they're doing. They're trying to do something a step ahead of God, and that's bad. That always leads to problems. Don't believe me? Talk to Abraham and Sarah about Ishmael. Okay, that was when Abraham and Sarah took a step ahead of God instead of allowing God to work out His plan of salvation. We, you know, because God already had Isaac. In, you know, in, in not even, even though he was not even yet conceived, he, Isaac was in the mind of, of God. Isaac was called out of the womb of Sarah. Because when, when the Lord and the two angels, when they came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, before they did that, they visited Abraham. And the Lord said to Sarah, this time next year, you'll be pregnant. And she laughed and said, I'm, I'm not 99 years old. My womb is barren. I'm not going to be pregnant. And, and the Lord goes, says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And then Sarah says, I didn't laugh. And God said, yeah, you did. In fact, you know what? Call his name Isaac. His name means laughter. God wants us to laugh. He wants us to have joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Right? Okay. Let's, let's, let's bring this down. Let's wrap this up. We know, I have, I have incontrovertible proof that we're going to rule with Christ. How do I know that? Because I'm an overcomer. How do I know that I'm an overcomer? Go with me to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. That this, is how, this is proof. This is, how we, this is how we study the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God in such a way that we know that we know that we know. 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 4 and 5. This is what it says. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that? Are you born again? Then you are, by definition of the Bible, an overcomer. Okay, why is that so important? Go with me to the book of Revelation. Answers are always in the back of the book, right? <laughs> Revelation chapter, I think it's two. Yeah, it's chapter two. Revelation chapter two. Okay. Revelation chapter two. I'm getting there. Revelation chapter two, beginning with verse 25. This is one of the seven letters that Jesus wrote to you, to me, to all churches of all ages, and also to these churches that existed back in the first century. He said, but hold fast to what you have until I come. Oh, there he is, talking about coming again. 
Okay? He who overcomes and keeps my work until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. And you'll, and you'll find out later on in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we're going to have thrones. We're going to be seated, seated on thrones. The church of Philadelphia was told that those who are liars, who call themselves Jews and are not, are going to recognize that they are loved of God and they're going to worship God at their feet. Not at the feet of Jesus, at the, their feet. And if you read Revelation 4 and 5 real carefully, there's the throne of God, which is the center, but then below the throne of God, before the throne of God, are 24 thrones, where the 24 elders sit upon. And on those, and the, those 24 elders, they have crowns. Stephanos crowns. Crowns of the overcomer. Okay? And they have white robes of righteousness. Okay? And, and they make a declaration of themselves. In chapter 5, they say that we have been redeemed from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. And we've been bought by the blood of God and have been made to be kings and priests unto the Lord. There's only one group of believers in all of history that are kings and priests to the Lord. That's the church. That's us. Those 24 elders represent us. They're not super angels. God doesn't give washed angels with his blood. He only washes humans. And it's not members of Israel because it's from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. Last time I checked, Israel wasn't the whole world. They may think they are, but they're not the whole world. Okay? There are many nations, tribes, tongues. There's only one group of believers that fit that category before the rapture. The church. And Jesus is telling us here in Matthew chapter 24 in verse 47, Assuredly I say to you, He will make them ruler over all His goods. You know what the advantage of watchful living is? Rulership. I believe that there are going to be people who are going to make it to heaven. They're going to be born again. They're going to be believers, you know, from the Old Testament and from different eras and stuff. But they may not necessarily rule with God. They may be servants to God, which, don't get me wrong, being a servant in heaven is better than being a ruler in hell. <laughs> right? Okay? But I believe that there will be Christians, believers, that will have a special rank of rulership. And I believe that that special blank of uh, rank, blank, I'm making up words, rank of rulership comes because they are watching and praying for the return of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we've compared and contrasted the two differences between the blessed hope, which only the church has, and the glorious appearing, which is going to happen in spite of what the world thinks. And Father, we just, um, I ask that the Christians across America, across the United States, would be watchful people. That they would live watchfully. That they would be watchful prayers, prayer warriors. Father God, our nation needs a revival. We need an awakening. Father, there are far too many people in this country that love evil. And, they, and they're very angry because the voters, most of the voters voted for a righteous ruler instead of an unrighteous ruler. And they're angry about it. And they're screaming at the sky. And they're, they're burning buildings, Father God. And it's because they bought into the lies. And I'm not saying that those who voted for the righteous ruler are all believers. Maybe many of those who voted for that ruler, all, that leader, also need to be born again, Father God. Only you know the condition of a person's heart. But Father, I believe that there is a spirit of lying across America, and not just across America, across the entire world, where people, people are now believing that, that your gender is not determined at birth. You've got to be kidding me. It's a scientific fact. They're believing every single stupid lie coming out of the mouth of Satan. Father God, we ask that you would roll that back. We ask that you would preserve our republic until the rapture, Father God. I pray that America would have a sweeping awakening, a sweeping revival, Father God, and that, that, that there would be that, the, that missionaries would rise up out of this nation and that 
they would go to all the ends of the earth. Lord, there was a time when America just flooded the world with missionaries. Let that happen again, Father God, because right now missionaries flood to America, Father God, because there's so many Americans who have been separated from their Judeo-Christian philosophy and life. Father, we pray for Israel. We pray that you protect them. Father, I pray for this little church right here. I pray, God, that we would, that we would repent. Lord, your word says there's, there's a way that this works. And that is, you said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, repent from their evil, cry out to you, you said you would heal our land. Father, God, help us to do that. Lord, I think we kind of did it before the election and 8,000 people got saved. But Lord, let all the Church of America of those who truly believe in Jesus come into that. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you. Pour yourself upon us. We just give you permission. Exercise all the gifts of the Spirit that you want in us. We want it all, Father God, because you are awesome. And Lord, we thank you. I thank you for Jesus who's coming back. And I can't wait. But until then, let me be faithful. A faithful watcher. Not a wheel watcher. A Jesus watcher. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus. Accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible-preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week, and may God bless you all the days of your life.